lucky we are the next year i get uh, more interviews and spend time in the the next year the next year is someone who is a uh, central pillar of this whole exercise now, professor rina marwa floor is yours thank you so much uh, professor singh and thank you uh, professor sridharan for being uh, with us in india in the indo pacific eastward who is being awaited uh, and so we begin with this uh, session focusing on regional economic multilateralism and uh, there will not be any antagonism regarding a manual here because we are all uh, women led a panel over here uh, we have katyaini uh, richaria and she would be speaking to us on emerging economic uh, multilateralism in the indo pacific uh, we have garima one who is going to be focusing on rcep and of course we all know him before after 7 years of intense negotiations uh start i would 10 minutes but i'll be grateful if you could wind up in 9 uh considering that we should keep to our time uh, so thank you so much and looking forward to our first uh, presentation katyaini could we see you please hello good afternoon ma'am so i'll start sharing my screen first yes 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 it's visible please yes you may start so uh thank you uh, as and all the esteemed scholars for giving me this opportunity uh, this paper which i am presenting here titled emerging economic multilateralism in the indo pacific basically deals with an overarching view of the existing mechanisms uh, which facilitate economic cooperation within the region their origins their trajectory of growth and in the conclusion with whatever little i have uh, acquired uh, by writing this paper a way forward in a line what can be the process of how can we integrate the indo pacific region as a whole in the coming future the asian development bank is in estimated the infrastructure requirement of the indo pacific region worth 1.7 trillion of investments annually until 2030 and a report by the asian development bank estimates that a 22.6 trillion of amount or 1.5 trillion per year from 2016 to 2030 is to be given into infrastructure needs by a developing asia in order to cater to its uh, growing requirements of infrastructure and economic growth according to the yungtac cla classification the of the out of the total 43 countries in indo pacific only 5 are developed developed 28 are developing and uh, two are least developed countries so we have a major chunk of the countries who are emerging economies and are developing in this region of indo pacific uh this estimation is done with regard to uh, the most inclusive de definition of indo pacific at hand which includes uh, starting from americas to africa now uh, coming coming to my next slide which is about the features of this economic multilateralism beginning with the origin of this term uh, we find that this term was origin originated by a german geopolitician karl karl hofschnell who used this term called indo pacificism wrong to uh, basically estimate the combined economic might of indian and chinese civilizations the economic potential and the economic contribution they have towards the global economic uh, to the towards the global gdp and the global economic growth this term was unique because it was first used uh, as a collaborative uh, mechanism of indian and pacific ocean uh, indian and pacific oceans are two distinct entities and were considered so until this term came into being and despite of the vast dissimilarities and distance caused by the two oceans uh, this term was used as a as a combined economic might of both the countries uh, so it indicates two uh, important facets that this term was first used for uh, as an economic entity and rather than uh, a security or a political geopolitical entity and second that uh, china is a very integral part of this indo pacific construct now uh the quad meeting that we uh, that we witnessed on 12th of march uh which was the first as the biden uh, administration took place 
tended to shift the orientation from the securitization of Indo-Pacific, the narrative which is overwhelmed with security uh, concerns towards an economic orientation. So it announced a working group for formation and distribution of vaccines wherein institutions like GICA and United States Development Finance Corporation, they were... Uh, tried to uh, they were trying to finance the vaccine requirements so that regional distribution of vaccines and regional research of vaccines could be enhanced the third point is about resilience in supply chain so we have seen that with regard to the dis disruptions caused in supply chain due to the pandemic and uh, the realize the evident realization of several countries of their over dependence on chinese uh, supply chain we see that countries like japan giving incentives to their firms to move out of china out of which most of them moved to vietnam or parts of southeast asia and only 15 out of, out of the 87 moved back to their home countries so we see this uh, enhanced uh, urge in these organizations in these firms to uh, to be a part of the larger integrated e economic environment of indo pacific this indo uh, this indo this economic multilateralism is basically spurring out of two uh, major branches one is the, uh, the realization of benefits of cooperative mechanisms and second is the rising infrastructure demand of these growing countries whether they are ldcs or whether they are emerging economies so a computational general equilibrium analysis done by dr prabir resh shows that uh, an additional benefit of dollar 1.2 billion uh, trillion will be accrued uh, when the countries of latin america and africa and the countries of developing asia which are left out from this construct become a part of indo pacific and the economic mechanisms uh, uh, institutions that are currently a part of indo pacific now, on the other hand, the rising infrastructure demand, uh, which is highlighted in the, uh, the recent World Bank's report on connecting to Thrive, uh, and it is basically more specific to Eastern South Asia. But if if those benefits are more holistically uh, expanded to the entire of Southeast, uh, entire of Indo-Pacific, we we find that the uh, the material gains are very much evident. Now. Uh, Coming on to the trajectory and processes of economic multilateralism, these the major instruments of economic uh, multilateralism in the region are A, trade blocks, and B, some national strategies which have become more inclusive to include uh, several projects in several countries of uh, Indo-Pacific. So basically, every major power has tried to shift the economic landscape of Indo-Pacific to align with their own version. The economic institutions are a result of processes of economic integration that began during the era of Asia Pacific. So this region has some remnants of the Asia Pacific uh, times and also new and newer uh, in, in, in instruments are being forged to cater to the demands of Indo-Pacific, the more inclusiveness of Indo-Pacific. Indo uh, starting with the formation of EPEC in 1989 and before that the APTA, the Asia Pacific Free Trade Area in 1975. The U.S. has tried to push for the creation of economic institutions and infrastructure based on its four pillars, funding, mobilizing private capital, cooperation among finances, and emphasis on high standards, which it puts as an alternative to Chinese uh, investments or Chinese projects. Uh, spearheaded by the BRI uh, because of lack of transparency. Uh, in 2018, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced an investment of $103 trillion million for creating. So we see that in response to the, Amer uh, through the American investments through BUILD Act and through these, uh, in, uh, through these institutions like U.S. Development Finance Corporation, Japan coming in in 2015 with its EPQI initiative, which was uh, later expanded as expanded uh, uh, partnership for quality investment based on these same four pillars emphasizing on transparency and accountability in order to exclude or in order to restrict chinese involvement in these uh, institutions now um, we have rcp currently becoming the largest uh, trade block of indo pacific with, 20, with having 29% of global gdp the countries which contribute 29% of global gdp a part of these uh, of this uh, trade block at the same time uh, the national initiatives like sagar which is talked about and epqi which i talked about mentioned uh, can be or has become more inclusive to include uh, six projects ranging from Iraq to Kenya, etc. Now, the 
challenges of uh, these remain. Uh, one is the different priorities, goods versus service, services and interpre interpretation. So interpretation of Indo-Pacific is not at all even. So also for Australia, security concerns and uh, providing alternatives to BRI is at uh, the first day. Uh, uh, and for Japan, at the same time, providing resilient infrastructure this, to the Southeast Asian countries and, and challenging the ideatic or hegemonic uh, uh, perspective of China with regard to its own cultural hegemony in Southeast Asia is a concern. Now, we talk about lack of inter-regional trade facilitation mechanism. So we have uh, we have no such uh, mechanism which exists to interlink uh, Latin America with Asia or Latin America with Africa or Asia with Latin America. So there is this Pacific Alliance, which was recently in 2017 uh, enhanced to include countries like New Zealand and Australia, uh, which act, which can act as a linkage between Latin American countries of South Pacific Ocean. But uh, still, there are only a few mechanisms to uh, to facilitate to facilitate interregional trade. Now, integrating Africa and South America into discourse, AAGC as a as a project was uh, initiated in 2017 by India and Japan, which tried to give Africa the centrality with, which it needed in uh, the discourse. And Latin America also, because the trade of, of Latin America with South uh, Asia is just 5% of the total trade accrued to both of the countries. So there's even more immense potential if Asia is linked to South uh, a, a, a South American countries. Also, the, there are uneven tariff rates in developing developed countries and there are uh, various uh, non-trade barriers which hinder the growth of economic institutions, inter-regional economic uh, institutions. Also, Mark Esper in, in his statement of 2020 said that this region of Indo-Pacific will be a hot, hotbed or epicenter for its for US's competition with China. But this, th this theater is also emerging as a space for competition amongst various Asian actors also. So this project of uh, EPQI and of BRI, they are often uh, accrued in stark contrast with each other because they tend to uh, pr provide infrastructure to the countries of Africa, uh, which is a hotbed of uh, competition of Asia, Asian countries. So with these, there are a lot of economic potential that this region and interlinking linking the economic potential could add to the regional prosperity and uh, the basic assumption that regional prosperity adds to regional security can be taken into consideration while uh, talking about economic multilateralism. Thank you. Thank you, Katyaini. Uh, uh, actually, you have taken a lot of micro and macro issues uh, together, so maybe you would need to restructure your paper. Can you stop presenting, please, so that we could uh, go on to the next presentation by uh, Garima Sangwan, speaking yes, on RCEP. Yes. So Garima, nine and maximum 10 minutes. Uh, please wind up so that I don't have to keep reminding. Garima, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, please, please start. Thank you for the introduction, ma'am. So the topic of uh, my presentation is RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and the new economic multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific region. So the my paper is divided into four segments with four objectives. How RCEP has evolved as an economic multilateralism, uh, multilateral institution, how it has become significant to the growth of multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific region, how is it... Uh, influencing other multilateral institutions in the region and what are the challenges and future prospects of ASEP. So uh, there was a time when Atlantic sea routes held a major prominence as far as the global trade routes were concerned and in recent times the um, center of gravity has moved towards Asia and the major reason behind this is the sea routes through which the crucial amount of global business goes on. Now, like every emerging geopolitical concept, Indo-Pacific is a construct of contested interpretation and changing equations. The growing dynamicity in the region is, driving, uh, is driven by its emergence as the new hub of global trade and energy supply, triggering strategic competition amongst various actors, uh, balance 
of balancing of power has to be maintained between growing belligerence of China and relative decline uh, of UN's alliance system on the simultaneous plane. And amidst this, there is a little doubt that Indo-Pacific region is witnessing a cautious, pragmatic, and consensus-building uh, approach to multilateral institutions. Now, speaking of this, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, which subsequently will refer with um, RCEP, is one of the vital arms of multilateral order in the Indo-Pacific region. Now, RCEP, speaking of RCEP, to begin with, the advent of trend of globalization, many voices have been calling for deeper Asian integration since the early 90s. Many competing missions were put forward as to what form such an integration should take place and which all countries should guide the process. Many uh, multilateral forums contributed to a considerable extent to explore possible pathways to achieve a free trade area of Asia Pacific, which is the uh, FTAAP. And one of the ways to achieve FTAAP was through APEC, Another was advanced by China, was to create an East Asia-wide free trade agreement comprising China, Japan, and Korea, which was known as ASEAN plus three. And a variant of this was ASEAN plus six agreement adding India, Australia, and New Zealand, which later on emerged as the ASEAN. So ASEAN brings these contrasting ASEAN-centered agreements in conjunction under one umbrella. Now, ASEP has become more significant at times when there is a rise of uh, hyper-nationalist political leadership of major economies. Has, it has set off a wave of analysis within the last half decade, heralding a rise of great power economic bilateralism, replacing multilateralism, and thereby introducing a new protectionist policies resulting in trends of reversing economic globalization. The US-China trade war, Brexit, are the cases in point. In Indo-Pacific region as, as well, the prospects of economic multilateralism stood diminished by the de facto modern state of global multilateral trade negotiation um, sponsored by WTO. Now, beyond its implications for trade and deepening economic ties between member nations, this is where ASEP represents a major resurgence of economic multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific region, and in particular, abridging the economic case for the region that has up till now been less developed. Now, starting with the, uh, how it is influencing other multilateral forums and institutions in the Indo-Pacific region, let us begin with the APEC, which is Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. So APEC was established with an objective to eliminate trade and investment barriers in Asia-Pacific region and currently consists of 21 member nations, including US, Mexico, New Zealand, Russia, Peru, apart from East Asian economies. Cooperation over diversity here has proved to be a formidable task and APEC faces challenges both from within and externally as well. First challenge which exists here with APEC is its original membership, <coughs> sorry, its original membership structure based on formulating a link between North America and East Asia. With such increased number of members to cover such an extensive Pacific Rim area, the inter internal cohesion in the forum begin, has begun to reduce. It is difficult to reach consensus on what is desirable for the future, given such an extensive number of member nations involved. Now here, a shift in the geopolitical scenario uh, is also of much importance. Emergence of India as a large economy, uh, which was not part of APEC, uh, which is still now not a part of APEC, and tremendous growth in China's stature and its uh, growing adventurism, increasing diplomatic initiatives of ASEAN, and relative U.S. decline has paved the way for a more cohesive and targeted regional economic integration bloc, which is uh, which was adaptive to the changing uh, which is adaptive to the changing realities of the region and strengthen the new Indo-Pacific vision. This shift in focus towards ASEP leaves APEC and its vision jeopardized. Now, Trans-Pacific Partnership (TPP). Uh, was presented as a comprehensive and high-graded regional agreement by the U.S. government and was suggested as a catalyst for a broader multilateral understanding. U.S.-led initiative aimed at wrestling influence from booming China. It was the TPP because of its ambitious coverage and ge geographic diversity of its members was a key plank of President uh, Obama's pivot to Asia. Several years into negotiation, 
TPP has not been able to come to the plateau due to its withdrawal due to the withdrawal of its major architect, that is the USA under President Trump's leadership. Now, while TPP might provide deeper integration, it is unclear that it will provide a long-term path for the Asian economies. TPP extends uh, to binary choice. The member, of con the member countries either reach up to the high standards of TPP or they do not. In contrast, ASEP ex explicitly tackles capacity building and has the scope for phases uh, for the phase manner and has the scope for phased adjustment, recognizing the significant diversity of stages of development within ASEAN and across its part. ASEP has a multilateral as a multilateral forum has thus emerged to become more dynamic with respect to the contemporary realities and has posed serious questions to the efficacy of the idea of trans-Pacific partnership. Now speaking of ASEP and ASEAN, it's a very distinguished relationship. ASEP formally endorses the principle of ASEAN centrality and uses a closed membership model limited to only to ASEAN and its current FTA partners, free trade partners. However, in economic terms, ASEAN is a comparatively small party, accounting to only 11% of ASEP's combined GDP, whereas China and Japan are the heavyweights of the bloc. ASEP, uh, ASEP though often labeled as China-led, but it is a triumph of the idea of ASEP is a triumph of ASEAN's middle power diplomacy. The value of large East Asian trade agreement has long been recognized, but neither China nor Japan, the region's largest economies, were politically acceptable as the architects of the project. Now, speaking of ASEP and Quad, now speaking of Quad, the Made in Quadrilateral Security Dialogue is experiencing uh, its moment in the Asian geopolitics. But it is important to see how RCEP and Quad members who have stakes in both platforms, that is Australia and Japan, will maintain the equilibrium. The bigger concern, however, is whether or not can, it can be developed from, it can be decoupled from the issues of sovereignty and security, especially when RCEP signatories, including Australia and Japan, have deep economic ties with China. Now, uh, coming to the conclusion part, uh, the challenges. What are the challenges which are being posed in front of ASEP? ASEP is, first of all, the structural loopholes. ASEP is not a complete free trade agreement in the sense that it codifies the removal of tariffs mostly on items that are already exempted due to uh, other free trade deals. And it has a loophole under which countries can maintain tariff in broad range of sectors. So it has to diversify in terms of what all um, factors, what all uh, what all pointers it is uh, extending to become uh, uh, an economic, uh, effective economic multilateral institution. Now, it is it will be hard for RCEP to provide immunity to ASEAN state from the impacts of Sino-US rivalry. The phase one truce agreement between the two major powers in January 2020 doesn't address uh, the government subsidies given by China for state-owned enterprises and increased U.S. restrictions on the Chinese investment. Subsequently, the clash between the two may be witnessed on many fronts. And uh, the, the one of the major challenges is India's absence from the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, the absence of India here, which is crucial to the concept of Indo-Pacific region, is a major challenge. Uh, why? Because India now India has decided to stay out from ASEP to protect the interests of its domestic industries, but ways to negotiate further and ha have been kept open by the ASEP members uh, as they want India to become uh, the member, the signatory of ASEP to join uh, it in future. Now, speaking of future prospects, the leader involved here in ASEP believes that the deal will help them to recover from economic devastations brought by coronavirus pandemic. Unlike China, Vietnam, South Korea, many Asian countries uh, did not have fast recoveries and still struggled with economic contractions in the quarter of this year. Now, in 2018, the IMF estimated that by getting rid of trade barriers within Asia, could boost GDP in the region by 15%. And if the world were to embrace the principles of open and free trade, it could boost global GDP by $10 trillion by 2025. So more importantly, the ASEP will simplify rules and procedures within a single arrangement for the many ASEAN plus one free trade agreements that currently exist, which would improve the efficiency of trade in the region. So... Towards the end, ASEP has the capacity to strengthen the economic case of evolving multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific region towards a free and towards a free and uh, open 
um, region. And it is not too narrow uh, and not also not too wide and diverse uh, so that it lacks cohesion. It is uh, somehow uh, being worked to, uh, you know, to make it more suitable to the idea of Indo-Pacific region particularly. So I would like to conclude now. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Garima, uh, for your uh, paper presentation. Uh, well structured. Uh, maybe you could bring in some of the, um, you know, elements of how there would be some inter intersection with uh, the WTO uh, rulings uh, and, uh, you know, how it would also, I mean, how it is an improvement over other uh, mechanisms which have existed. So, because of Already, China has an uh, FTA with ASEAN. So, is it really going to be uh, some, you know, incremental uh, benefits? Uh, so, may I please uh, request our uh, discussant, uh, uh, Ashish Adhikari? Please, uh, could you present your comments? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Uh, 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 the wonderful papers and wonderful presentations by the presenters. Uh, uh, first, I will talk a bit. Uh, I'll I'll become a bit bit specific and talk about specific uh, authors and papers, and then I'll try to uh, give some generalized uh, points at the end. So I would like to begin with uh, Garima Sangwani's paper about RCEP, and uh, she has raised some pertinent. Uh, uh, issues and shows uh, and uh, showed a, a traversal, a development of RCEP from uh, ASEAN plus three to ASEAN plus six minus India. And uh, uh, she has divided her paper into four parts. She has talked about specialized RCEP and she has also discussed about uh, RCEP and other multilateral institutions and challenges uh, in the future. Uh, the interesting part is uh, she has empirically defined uh, the prospect of RCEP if India is not present. Uh, like the whole population uh, will remain in 2.2 billion from 3.6 billion if India is not present in the RCP and even the contribution to world GDP. And uh, one important argument that she has made is uh, uh, how will the participant countries manage their dual presence in the Indo-Pacific region like Australia and Japan in RCP and in both parts. So how will they manage that? that that's a pertinent question that she has raised. Uh, I have some suggestions uh, to her. Uh, my first suggestion is uh, uh, maybe we need to uh, define whether RCP is a part of uh, Indo-Pacific or not, uh, especially after India has uh, left uh, uh, the partnership uh, at the last moment. Maybe we need uh, some uh, uh, existing references uh, to, to put uh, the RCP into this uh, uh, geographical scope of Indo-Pacific. Uh, and uh, your third part, you have talked a lot about uh, RCEP and its association with uh, other uh, multilateral institutions like APEC and Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, probably some importance of the parts of this chapter could be accommodated in the second chapter where you have talked about the conceptualization of uh, RCEP and, uh, uh, and a bit less about uh, other multilateral institutions. Uh, uh, it, it, I, I perceive them as a bit uh, descriptive and uh, a bit uh, less interrelated with the, with the main argument that you are trying to make. So, and uh, to add on, uh, RCEP also has some uh, important avenues that we should not miss as far as I understand. Uh, China, South Korea and Japan, and uh, they have uh, came into a single platform uh, to discuss which they have been trying since very long and uh, we're not able to furnish it in an adequate way. So maybe that also would be an important aspect to understand uh, uh, RCEP. Uh, regarding Katya Eni's paper, uh, the author has uh, eloquently presented the process of economic multilateralism in the region uh, through the formation of uh, trade blocks and infrastructure discussed about uh, and the trade blocks that have been created and uh, the, the necessity of infrastructure, the high necessity of infrastructure. She has also talked about the PRI and BTN in, the, in her paper. And the interesting part that I, ha I, I liked on her paper was uh, 
that uh, she has done a deeper analysis of the challenges that uh, the economic multilateralism might face in future. Uh, like she has uh, talked about the different interests of uh, LDCs and developed countries in the same region. The LDCs uh, might want to reduce import tariffs, where, whereas the developed countries might want uh, cheap labor. So that is the, the area. So she has talked a bit deeper uh, uh, in the in the in the in the aspect of challenges that are uh, that the economic multilateralism might face uh, in in the Pacific. And my suggestion uh, to her would be that uh, uh, I think the, the the significance of ASEAN would be quite important if we, if we talk about uh, multilateralism, economic multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific, and uh, the strategy, its strategic presence and its regional turmoil is crucial to us the study of uh, Indo-Pacific multilateralism and the way it has been handling um, both powers and even regional powers, uh, uh, quote unquote, in an adequate way uh, till now. So I think that is also one of the foundation that's, that we need to consider while we talk about economic multilateralism uh, in the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific. And uh, one small suggestion that I would like to make is uh, after going through a paper, I found out that uh, she has a long table uh, comparing PRI and uh, Blue Dot Network. And uh, I think uh, you are trying to discuss more about uh, the avenues of mul economic multilateralism. And uh, uh, PRI and BDM would be a comparative study of how specific uh, countries look at that region. So if you don't want to migrate into that uh, uh, framework maybe uh, maybe we can consider uh, it a bit uh, a bit a, a bit lesser of those comparisons and all if you if you want um, garima has uh, elaborated rcep with its focus on economic significance of the whole region and patani has focused on the process of multilateralism uh, through different trade blocks and infrastructure projects uh, all presenters have talked about the challenges of economic multilateralism in one way or other. Just, I would, I would like just some of uh, uh, adding one or two points uh, from my side. Mm, like, uh, for example, uh, we have talked about uh, the evolution of multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific, but uh, uh, we should not uh, also forget uh, the how big powers perceive that uh, region uh, in an economic way. So I think a major aspect is how United States and China are they uh, trying to cooperate into a multilateral avenue or are they trying to uh, develop uh, uh, different economic blocks. So maybe that would also provide a, a deeper insight to understand the economic multilateralism uh, in the region. And uh, uh, to add on uh, the the, the second point I would like to bring attention is, is, is the generalization of the argument that uh, we are generalizing this argument that the multilateralism, quote unquote multilateralism uh, in the Indo-Pacific, but we should not also forget that the multilateralism itself is not, uh, is, sorry, is, 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 is a byproduct of strategic competition between two countries as well. When big powers uh, compete, like for example, we just talked about the, uh, the, the the debt trap uh, from China and how United States is planning to uh, fit in to manage that trip trap. Maybe that might be an avenue of uh, multilateralism in the future. We don't know. So uh, those those kind of uh, exploratory areas, I think uh, we also need to consider. Uh, thank you. That's that's what I would like to add on. Excellent papers. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ashish Adhikari ji. And, um, uh, we open the floor this afternoon, and uh, if anybody would like to make any comments or suggestions or questions, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, Professor Swaran Singh, would you like to yeah. okay. uh, make thank some you. comments? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Marwa, for giving me a uh, chance to speak. I thought maybe Shadil wanted to say something, and maybe he can speak after. I have made a few comments. One friendly suggestion to all paper writers. Uh, let me first say, Ashish, uh, as I said to other discussing, uh, please, if you can uh, send an email to the three paper writers or to us giving your comments, we would like to share your comments with the paper writers. 
that to all the teachers as to as my very dear friends a very friendly suggestion after today's session is over please sit down take a pen and paper and recapitulate the discussion that happened on your on your paper now if you think you will do it tomorrow you will forget much of the discussion so i suggest pen down uh, on your paper as to what was uh, the suggestions made because sometimes paper writers hear more then discussions has actually said because you are actually focusing on the team so sometimes discussion doesn't even know what he conveyed without actually intending and paper writer still heard so your mind is focused on this discussion please uh, make make those notes for yourself uh, very quickly now specifically for these three papers katyayani uh, you have to make sure that you only focus on multi i don't see i see that you can tell you have to make sure this is a project on multilateralism and this applies to all three papers and you have to look at only specifically on multilateralism as an idea as institutions individual nations policies actions episodes will be only reference points they will not be the argument the main argument will be how multilateralism is uh, evolving moving changing transforming and in your case economic multilateralism that you are addressing will be woven around apec because that is a very significant uh, multilateral institution which uh, needs uh, an important focus here and of course when you focus on uh, apec you will compare it with either the blue dot network or epiq that japan has been pushing with the g7 initiative and bri again even there's a lot of temptation to say a lot of things about bri don't say those things look at bri as multilateral another framework multilateral framework which is nothing but coalition of bilaterals there is nothing quintessentially multilateral about it it's coalition of bilaterals but if you put cherry on the cake of very very much high summit meetings in beijing that's a new kind of multilateralism you know, very very high profile multilateral summit meetings uh, of bri in beijing uh, just like the concert of billing that united states has flaunted in early 1990s as multilateralism which was actually voluntary forces 99% american and 10% 5% others so it's also a deviation but a new version of of a framework of multilateralism so look at it fundamentally from apec axis but comparing apec to the other likely economic multilaterals whether it is uh, aagc or it is bdn or it is epqi or it is bri those will be something you're comparing the quintessential apex because the conventional economic multilateralism in the region is apex and you are saying how is it coping with the new ideas floating to garima arsep is your focus there is a certain amount of clarity on that but i think discussion there is an important question minus india does certain disjunction begin to appear within indo pacific and uh, rcep second i think again since your focus will be primarily rcep uh, you will have to then compare it or you know address other ideas ttpi for example you know, or asian centric initiatives you know, or i think even china because i I, if you don't agree with me, don't do that. But my assumption would be that this paper can also beautifully underline how RCEP, which was essentially in the beginning an ASEAN initiative, has over years evolved and become a China-led initiative, and that partly explains India's exclusion. But we don't have to deal with that part. By India exclusion, India's exclusion impacting RCEP. creating a disjunction with the pacific is relevant and looking at china led shift from asean centricity to china led model of rcep and how does that compare again with tdpi model 
uh, or even you know epic if you want to just see if rcp is replacing epic in that sense in that sense explosion of us is uh, there is very essential change in multilateralism economic multilateralism uh, with devyani i am uh, also said to hear that her sister is uh, positive and uh, if she can we will accommodate her paper tomorrow in the last session uh, but if anyone else has any other comments to either me and uh, professor marlo uh, you could now share them we have little bit of time uh, with permission of chair yes. of course uh, if uh, jumel uh, from philippines uh, would like to ask a question his hand is raised just jumel may you uh, could you please uh, switch on your video okay <laughs> Yeah, I only yes. see videos. I am uh, yes. Sorry, sorry. I I just uh I just opened my my speaker. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Swaran Singh and Dr. Rina and the entire uh, AAS for this so wonderful event. Um. Recently, uh, there were at least forty-four ships or Chinese uh, vessels, <laughs> including the. A military uh, men or the militias in the uh, in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask the uh, uh, the speakers whether in session one, two, and three right uh, earlier, what are their thoughts about um, China's recently uh, coercive tactics in the South China Sea, and at the same time the United States uh, response using that. Um, um new newly uh, newly um, pushed uh, foreign policy of the current administration under uh, president biden uh, vis a vis the pushback the mutual defense treaty since 1951 so with that i uh, thank you so much uh thank you uh, jumel uh, for your comment and question uh, though it does not really pertain to economic multilateralism, which is the scope of uh, this particular session. Uh, so if anybody else would like to respond um, to Jamel. Yeah, because uh, I, I just actually raised that, uh, uh, Dr. Rina and Do Dr. Swaran Singh, because uh, I've, I've, I've heard that... Um, a lot of speakers were okay, mentioning about this. about the about the quad about the uh, these uh, Indo Pacific um, quad alliances. Yes, they and, were of course mentioning uh, China's role and, and yes. So I I hope there's someone from the uh, India's that's, that's, India's perspective or uh, India's vantage point who can who can talk uh, who can talk about. Uh, his or her ideas about uh, about this uh, Indo-Pacific and then this uh, economic uh, bargaining chip of uh, bargaining chip of the of China or the PRC or the People's Republic of China using the uh, Maritime Silk Road, the Obor or the One Belt One Road, while there is a you know uh, ongoing quad quad um, pushback or or campaign among Australia, Japan, India, and the uh, United States. And I believe that the Philippines is in the middle of these quad alliances. And at the same time, India is, of course, uh, not quite far from us. But I believe there is a, a certain line that can be that can be a, a link or for cooperation between the Philippines, not only uh, not only uh, economically, not only with the military exercise, uh, exercises, but also in terms of the political security that can be taken advantage by the uh, by the Indian government. Um, Sir Shakil Hossein, would you like to say something? Please? You're mute. Uh, oh, sir, sorry, sir. Thanks for uh, inviting me, calling me. I would like to add something to this gentleman, and that, that is a question. If China make any aggression towards any uh, respective countries like Philippines or South Korea or uh, Indonesia, then what Quad will do? That is because I, uh, my concern is to security. What earlier I have asked because a Quad it is 
progressing towards economic uh, cooperation but uh, for a large it, it is very much related to the security concern if china make any aggression to any country of the south china sea then what will be the action of the court that's a difficult question also partly not uh, related to the book project that we are doing uh, but uh, my assumption is china uh, never believes in an open aggression and if you notice what china has been doing last 40 years in south china sea it's extremely incremental expansion uh, short of uh, you know, going for war so that's its and uh, and bilateral engagement that's what china does and philippines also knows very well you know that uh, there will be economic arm twisting in uh, philippines and as we have seen uh, president duterte has been bowing to china and continues to want to engage china economically yeah, but yeah. of I... course the recent uh, incidents do show that uh, you know the aggression Uh, is increasing, and that is why we are seeing the South China Sea and ASEAN countries, uh, you know, so kind of closely uh, getting embroiled in this and becoming a theatre for superpower competition as well. Yeah, I I I also agree with uh, the statement of Dr. Swaran and uh, Dr. Rina. Uh, thank you so much for your thoughts about. And in your concern to us, uh, Filipinos here in the uh, in the South China Sea, because uh, I believe that the that the essence in the realization of cooperation and uh, strategic partnership of Quad also rests to the uh, to the idea whether these alliances could actually truly um, give its support beyond the mutual defense treaties uh, that they have entered in, whether. Uh, a couple of decades ago, um, there. I also uh, agree with Dr. Rina that um, our our president here is quite, you know, uh, of course, leaning towards uh, China's uh, China's um, uh, grace, so to speak. But we are we are also hoping that uh, the uh, the recent statement of the Foreign Secretary for the Department of Foreign Affairs. And the Department of National Defense here in the Philippines could actually alter the game theory in the in the foreign policy and and, and the and the at the same time the uh, uh, geopolitical chip ins in the uh, Indo Pacific and the ASEAN as an integration or cooperation. Thank you so much, ma'am and sirs. I I am actually learning a lot from this event. I hope there would be a lot of events here and also uh, some. Per- Some perspectives uh, in the near future coming from us, because I also observe that most of the speakers are very eloquent and very good uh, uh, Indians, and I I really admire Indians actually, because I I, I believe um, the our our dean in the University of the Philippines at Diliman, uh, I I, be, I believe is also uh, Dr. Asantarita uh, in the in the UP uh, Asian Center. Um, has actually uh, been uh, actively participating in the AAS or the uh, Association. That's um, yes, uh, for the uh, Asian scholars. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am and sir. Thank, thank you, you. thank you. Please do join us tomorrow as well, and we are going to conclude this session. But uh, one uh, minute each to our two presenters thank for today, you. and then a final vote of thanks by Dr. Gazala. Uh, yes, Professor Swaran. The Tesh was trying to say something. Yes, the Tesh. Yeah, with the permission, I may I just comment a little bit on what Jumail said. Uh, yes. To add to the discussion, uh, there's no doubt that the uh, India's relationship with Philippines definitely is getting stronger. You would have seen two dimensions. One of them being the whole vaccine development issue, where after the last Joint Commission meeting, the Foreign Secretary of Philippines actually said, "We don't only want vaccines from India." we want to get into deeper healthcare learning cooperation with india so that was really a very strong element and of course the fact that we are on the cusp now of doing the whole brahmos transaction with philippines but i think the philippines needs to it has been a cardinal principle of india's foreign policy that we are not appropriating ourselves to specific in you know individualized maritime disputes that china has with its 
uh, with with its with its disputed neighbors in ASEAN. We comment more in the in the nature of principles that we stand for, which is freedom of navigation both over flight and and in sea. But we don't appropriate ourselves to any of these issues, which are fault lines between ASEAN countries and China. So, for Philippines to expect us to, you know, take a stand would be a little too unreasonable. Also, as we said, given the way in which President Duterte blows hot and cold and tries to basically use the U.S.-China dialectic to his tactical advantage, I think also makes Philippines a little bit of a kind of a hot potato in terms of dealing with. But I think we have to look at the larger trend. which is that within asean's maritime fulcrum i think the triangle that is emerging of vietnam indonesia and philippines is something that i think the quad has to take on board to find some kind of a convergence with these three countries to be able to create a potential pushback for china within the south china sea and to also build counter leverage on china thank you uh thank you so much that is i think that was wonderful the counter narrative which you said with uh, philippines vietnam certainly becoming closer and indonesia yes. also uh, joining in so uh, last uh, two minutes to our uh, two presenters for today and then the final vote of thanks thank you so much ma'am and sir for your precious comments and i will try to make it more structured and in include whatever more explicitly state about the comparison of bdn and bri as was mentioned by ashish sir thank you for your comments thank you uh, yes garima yes ma'am i want to extend my heartfelt thanks to as for this opportunity and uh, thank you ashish sir for your valuable comments i will definitely incorporate uh, and thank you suran sir for your comments too Uh, thank you so much uh, thank you katyaini and uh, garima we miss deviani uh, with this may i uh, request dr gazala faridi who's also been a member of the academic uh, committee to steer this uh, conference and uh, thank you all for a very successful uh, conclusion for the first day when we had three important sessions setting the tone conceptualization of the theme and then going into the uh, aspects of uh, multilateralism in the economic uh, sphere particularly uh, we all look forward to your joining us tomorrow as well and uh, for the formal vote of thanks to dr gazala faridi thank you ma'am so on um, behalf of the association of asia scholars uh, it gives me immense pleasure to extend a vote of thanks to all the participants on the successful completion of the first day of the conference uh, we have truly enjoyed the various exchange of ideas and it has indeed been a very great learning experience for each one of us uh, so a hearty congratulations to all those who presented today and also deep gratitude uh, to professor jindal professor shridharan and dr reena marwa ma'am for chairing the sessions today uh, a very big thank you also to dr rao dr paru lekar and mr adhikari for excellent discussing the papers and providing their invaluable feedback um also uh, this conference could simply not have been put together without the backbone of the association which is professor swarn singh sir and reena ma'am uh, there is so much to learn by just being in your company and i would also like to thank all the participants who joined us from various corners of the world today uh, a very big thank you uh, to the entire team of the association of asia scholars especially to dr silky kaur uh, a special shout out to the technical team and all the interns also associated with us uh, I I would also like to mention that had it not been for the pandemic then probably we would have never got used to introduced to and used to this uh, virtual platform uh, that helps us you know get over the physical and temporal distances um, among us uh, so with this i would like to once again thank everyone whose uh, contribution has made this day a uh, first day a great success and i hope to see we all hope to see each other again tomorrow thank you Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks, sir. Mm -hmm. Enjoy yourself. Make notes of discussion and then enjoy yourself. <laughs> The perfect professor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Always engaged. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day and a beginning to the weekend. <laughs> Thank you so much for staying on with us.
Uh, Dr. Dates, uh, thank you so much, sir. Dr. Dates, thank you. Sir. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Dates. Excellent mm. and valuable comments. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you, Rina. Thank you, Swaran. Thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank awesome. you, Sarsitha. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Yes, see you tomorrow. <laughs> thank you.